Well, beloved in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Over the past few Sundays, we have been working our way through Matthew 25 with Jesus' admonitory teachings concerning the last day, the day of final judgment. Two weeks ago, we had the parable of the five wise and five foolish virgins. Last Sunday, we heard the parable of the talents. And today, we have the completion of this study with the parable of the sheep and the goats. For those of you who miss these teachings, I strongly advise that you go online to watch what you missed. Or for the lucky few who received a pastor's text, I hope they click on the link and watch the sermons. Because, loved ones, these three parables from the Lord form one of the grandest and most important of Christ's sermons. And there is one sure and sober thing that should stand out within these warnings from Jesus. And that is that there are those who are ready and are prepared and who will rejoice in his coming. And there are others, because of their own negligence and unpreparedness, who will see this day with much misery and much despair. Our parable this morning describes what will happen to both classes of individuals when the Lord returns to separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Today's reading was our gospel lesson from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 25, verse 31 through verse 46. I would ask again, if you're able, please rise for the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will, will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. These are your holy words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us now in its truth. Your words are truth. Thank you. Please be seated. This teaching from Jesus, like the other Judgment Day teachings we have been studying over these past few weeks, should be a constant reminder of how temporary and how fleeting our human existence is. 
And realizing this, our primary motivation in this life should be to be ready and prepared for whenever our human lifespan comes to an end. And we stand before the Lord on that great day. And, and we can see that in our parable, can't we? Because the text says, on that day, the Lord will sit on his glorious throne and begin the great separation of those who are his from those who are not. So we want to be always ready for that event. And that is why my primary purpose as your pastor is to prepare you through the word of God for the day you will stand before the Lord Jesus to give an accounting of your life. <laughs> and I, I also know some people don't like to hear stern preaching like this or receive a text from their pastor. But truth be told, regarding this or any other clear teaching from God, I really don't care about your opinions or your sentiments outside of what the Bible teaches. Why? Because I take my vocation seriously. Because the Bible warns men who teach to be very careful to teach only what the Bible imparts. It says in James 3, 1, which reads, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. That is a strong cautioning to all pastors that we are going to be judged more critically based on what we are teaching those under our authority. The Bible also says in Galatians 1.10, which reads, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Now that verse, by the way, applies to all Christians. But these truths are why I take my preaching of the word in a straightforward law and gospel manner seriously. And friends, you as a hearer of that word should too. Listen to these words. Hebrews 13, 17 reads, Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. In other words, you make your pastor miserable because you're complaining about stuff. It doesn't help you out at all because it just burdens me down. So I guess the next time you hear a sermon that hits a nerve, or your pastor takes a strong, stubborn stand on protecting God's church, and your first reaction is to get angry? Before you do, I ask that you please closely think about these words of God. Now before we dig into the heart of our text today, I want to provide just a little more setup. Because I think it will help us to have a better understanding of this parable and how we should be receiving it as Christians. Within the Bible, the fundamental teaching in both the Old and the New Testaments is that God is eternal, God is unchangeable, God is almighty, all-knowing, all-seeing, and everywhere present. It also teaches very strongly that he is holy, he is perfect, and he is pure, and that he will not tolerate sin. Psalm 5.4 reads, You are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. Evil may not dwell with God. Think closely about that statement because it is vital for us to understand this about God. You see, no one can ever have a correct understanding of Christianity until they first understand God's unchangeable character and how much he hates sin. And this, of course, leads to a huge problem, doesn't it? Because every single person, because of the original sin passed down from Adam, are born into this world sinful. 
Listen to how this truth has been recorded for us by David under the strict guidance of the Holy Spirit. Again from the Psalms. Psalm 51.5 reads, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, in sin, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now not only does this tell us that every baby in the womb is a living human life and to be treasured and to be preserved, but that every one of us from the moment of our conception are born into this world as sinful, unspiritual beings. And because of that, we in our natural state, well, we enter this world despising God. The great apostle Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 2.14, which reads, The natural person, that's all of us. We are all born unspiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. They don't make sense. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned, spiritually dead and blind from birth, hating God. Now this is one of the most critical doctrines found in the Bible. Not only because it's true, but because without a clear understanding of who we are and who Scripture tells us God is, no one can ever correctly understand what being a Christian is all about and why we need Jesus. You see, friends, every single one of us are born into this world without any spiritual good in our entire being. Our entire inclination from birth is focused only on ourselves and the evil of our flesh. And therefore, we are intolerant of God. As the Apostle Paul said elsewhere, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Which reaffirms that every single person is born into this world despising God. So what do we do? How is that terrible attitude toward God to be lifted off of us? Well, remember I said that God is a holy, pure, and perfect God? This means that he is also righteous, which means that he is fair and he is just. And because he is just, he created a plan for all the world to be saved. That plan is his powerful gospel, the message of the repentance of sin and the forgiveness of them in Christ, who alone is our salvation. And people loved by God when the gospel is heard with ears to hear and not rejected, the Holy Spirit begins to work faith within our hearts. And a radical transformation begins to take place. A new birth in Christ occurs. And your attitude towards God and his church turns from one of rebellion and unwantedness to one of love and thankfulness. Now I realize that was a rather long introduction into this text. But we are dealing with Christ's most serious teaching, the great day of separation. And in order for us to have a full understanding of this teaching, we must first understand the Father's anger toward our sin, and that in our natural sinful state, we can never dwell with Him. Only then will we ever truly appreciate the love He had by sending His own Son into the world to rescue us from our condition. So in the parable, Jesus tells us that when he returns, he will return in full glory. In other words, no more meek and mild Jesus who walked this earth and who humbled himself unto death. This will be Almighty God. This will be God in the flesh, reappearing with all his angels in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet to sit on his glorious throne to judge both the living and the dead. Matthew 25, 31 through 33 reads, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. 
Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. What is being described here are the formalities of an otherworldly high court where the judge in his full and supreme authority has his angel servants assemble together the entire human race into two groups, one on his right and one on his left. Then he sits down upon his glorious throne to sentence every person of every nation of this world since the beginning of time and give to them what they deserve according to their faith, according to their ways, and the fruit of their deeds. And Christ's judgment will be perfect, friends. There will be no mistakes because he has an ability that you and I do not have. He can look right into the human heart and see everything within. So on that day, all people of all time, both Christian and non-Christian, will stand before the almighty, all-knowing, perfect judge. And the great separation of humankind will be made. And the separation will remain forever. But listen now closely to how Jesus describes this event. Matthew 25, 34 reads, Then the king will say to those on his right, the Christians, those who truly believed in him, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Did you catch that? We sang it in our song that, that Luther wrote. Jesus tells us that the Father's plan has been prepared from the very beginning when he created the world. <laughs> and in, in his eternal and infallible foreknowledge, he knew all of us before we were born. And he knew us all and what his grace would succeed in making us. Which then means... We who have been made alive in Christ Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit through his gift of grace will be placed on the right side of the Lord in his kingdom, fully justified, justified, never sinned, justified, kept the law perfectly. And that means, loved ones, that not one single, nasty, dirty, rotten, filthy sin of yours or mine will be mentioned as we stand before the judge. You see, if you truly do love the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that he died for your sins and you openly confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, you will not be examined you will not be probed nor found guilty of any crime on that day. You will be found innocent. You will be found righteous and pure, justified in Christ. And because of that, you will experience a blessed dispensing of God's royal grace, a pouring out of his unending love and his bounteous favor. And friends, what is so mind-blowing here <laughs> is that if you do believe in Christ and you do confess him as your Lord, every single thing that you have ever done for him in this lifetime will be brought forward, recognized, and announced before the, the, the court of heaven. <laughs> So if you love the Lord Jesus and you possess a saving faith in him, if you trust in him as your salvation, well then, friends, there is absolutely nothing at all for you to fear on that great day of separation because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for those who love God in Christ. But listen carefully, because if you are a Christian in name only, 
no matter what you have done that might be seen as good by those in the world, means nothing to God without the Lord Jesus living and reigning in your life. Because it is impossible to please a holy God without the sinless Christ alive in your heart. Within our Lutheran Confessions, the Book of Concord, this is summed up very nicely. The Apology of the Augsburg Confession reads, These passages and all others like them where works are praised in the Scriptures must be taken to mean not only outward works, but also the faith of the heart. Since the Scriptures do not speak of hypocrisy, but of righteousness in the heart and of its fruits. Whenever law and works are mentioned, we must know that Christ, the mediator, should not be excluded. He is the end of the law, and he himself says, apart from me, you can do nothing. By this rule, as we have said earlier, all passages on works can be interpreted. Therefore, when eternal life is granted to works, it is granted to the justified, those who have been saved by faith. None can do good works except the justified, who are led by the Spirit of Christ. Nor can good works please God without the mediator Christ and faith, according to Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Simply put, you don't work to be saved. But after you're saved, you certainly work, as Dad used to say. Which then reinforces the Bible's truth that we are saved only by God's unmerited grace and favor, and nothing we can ever do, no matter how superb, will add anything to our salvation. However, however, according to Jesus, there must be an evidence of that faith found in every Christian. Listen to Jesus tell us what that evidence is. Matthew 25, 35, and 36 reads, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Now remember I said that no one can look into a person's heart to see if they are a Christian except God? While that is a true statement, according to Jesus, here, what we just read, is a visible evidence of one's faith. And when Christians love our neighbors in this way, when we love God in active service to the church, when we use our talents to build up the kingdom on earth, we are working for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's nothing we do on our own. This blessing flows from the Father. It is the natural output of the heart knowing that we have been given Christ. But now listen to the response from these Christians who faithfully just, their faithfulness has just been recognized. Listen to what they say in their tone. Matthew 25, 37 through 40 reads, Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. The way Jesus tells us how the righteous answer him is very significant. Why? Because they don't remember any of this. The list of the works that is laid out before them is a total surprise. Lord, when did we see you hungry? And when did we feed you? When did we welcome you or visit you in prison? You see, a true believer isn't chalking up credit for himself. He's not keeping a checklist of marked items on all the good things he's done. He doesn't brag about his accomplishments or make it a point to show others what he himself is giving or doing. 
Christians do these acts of love for others and for God's church because of the saving relationship they have been given in Christ. It is that natural outflow of a heart filled with faith and love for Jesus. In fact, if you truly do love Jesus, you literally can't help yourself. You just do what now comes naturally. You're concerned for the souls of others, so you talk to them about Jesus. And then you, in the process, you love and serve them, and you love and serve God. So the thought of obtaining some kind of credit for doing what flows naturally out of the heart of those who love God is something that is not on the mind of any true Christian. But what about those who are separated to the left? What does Jesus say to them? Well, here's where the story comes to the really sad part. Matthew 25, 41 through 46 reads, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Friends, nobody wants to hear those words. That's going to be a terrifying moment for millions of people. Then he said to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Friends, Jesus will hand out two verdicts on the day of judgment. Innocent, well done, good and faithful servant, and guilty away into eternal punishment. Those who are separated to the left are guilty they are the ones who, by their own careless neglect and complacency, have rejected God's gift of faith and eternal life. And because of their rejection, they will hear the terrifying words from the lips of Jesus, I never knew you. Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, the picture of fire itself is certainly terrible, but an eternal fire increases its terribleness, and the one made ready for the devil and his angels raises its terrible nature to the ultimate degree, as this eternal fire is one that tortures both evil spirits and men that have bodies. And what really makes these words from God to those who rejected him so terrifyingly unfortunate is that God does not want anyone to go to hell. Hell was never intended for us. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels as the fit punishment for their rebellion against God, not for us as his cherished creation. But there's only two places to spend eternity. Either in the eternal bliss and joy of heaven, or the fiery torment of an eternal hell. And while God certainly wants and desires everyone to be with him in his glorious kingdom for all eternity, the sad fact is many reject his gracious gift, one for us in Jesus. So all who reject God and his redemption offered in Christ, all who try to earn salvation or add to it with their own works and merits, everyone who chooses to turn away from the Lord to follow the ways of the world, all of these cursed will go to hell with Satan and his evil spirits for all eternity 
Because the wicked cannot remain with the righteous and evil cannot dwell with God. Friends, every single one of us are born into this world in an unspiritual, sinful state, which then means from birth we are focused only on things that are against God, and therefore we are unwelcoming and intolerant of Him. And because of that fact, nothing we could ever do on our own without Jesus is acceptable to the Father. And that's the point of the parable. You see, loved ones, your relationship to the Father is not based on what you do or don't do. You are pleasing to God because of what Jesus did for you. Jesus lived a life that met God's perfect standard. Christ lived the life that you and I are supposed to live but can never live. And when he died on the cross, his atoning death paid our sin debt in full. And when he rose so gloriously out of that grave, it was a sign that the Father in heaven accepted his work for us. Which means your salvation has been fully accomplished in Christ. Your salvation is a finished work. There is nothing left to do. Simply put, only by trusting in Jesus and his forgiveness of sins earned for you on the cross can the promise of God's grace and mercy be secured. But people loved by God, Jesus still wants us to produce good works. Not in order to be saved, but because we already are. So while you wait for that day, let your faith shine before others. Let the evidence of your faith be seen by all. So live for your neighbor. Serve God's church. And most of all, rejoice that God wants you to be with him forever. Glorious Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for your words today. Allow the Holy Spirit now to work that word into everyone's heart, to treasure these words, to receive these words, to frankly be feared by these words, and then to cherish them and understand that when we trust in Jesus, there's nothing to fear. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen.